Singfield Cup round three, and I'm looking at the game between world champion Magnus Carlsen and the outspoken 19-year-old American Hans Niemann. Before we go any further, thank you very much to Robert Rees for subbing for me over the first two rounds. Excellent analysis. So here we go with this game. Carlsen and Niemann having a good start to the taunt, both on one half out of two. Carlsen with the white pieces. You'd think he'd be hoping to capitalize on this good start. White against Niemann, who, well, inexperienced at this very high level. Uh, but he is extremely ambitious. Carlsen plays g3 against the Nimzo. Well, you know, that leads to unbalanced positions. Normally, if you want to go in for g3 variations, you play like this with knight f3. And after c5, then g3. I mean, he's... The theory of this is pretty well worked out, but still, you can get some, some um, quite double-edged positions from it. But g3 immediately <clears throat> doesn't have such a good reputation. In fact, it normally transposes into uh, a line of the Catalan here. Knight f3 is absolutely normal, and then pawn takes c4, and so on, and then knight c6. For those of you that want to track the theory. But what Carlsen does now is unusual. And it also looks a bit weird to me. Because white is, is spending a whole tempo. Um, when you, you really want to be developing very quickly. It doesn't feel right. Uh, Niemann exchanged on c3. So, of course, he's giving up the two bishops. But he gains a tempo. And now he takes on c4. Knight f3. Well, we've seen Carlsen in these kind of Catalan-type positions use the two bishops extremely well. But it's going to take a bit of time for that bishop to enter the game. You know, you want to be able to play a4 and, and bishop a3. But obviously with the pawn on a3, that's a problem. And c5 strikes out at white center straight away. And pawn takes pawn on d4. <clears throat> Queen takes d4. Magnus likes his end games. Knight c6. And here instead of taking on d8, Carlson just recovers the pawn on c4. But with these pawns on c3 and a3, uh, it's not altogether ideal. It, it, as I mentioned before, it's very hard to get this bishop on c1 into the game successfully. You know, you'd love to have it on a3 striking down here, but it's not such a great piece. Those split pawns are a problem for white. So, you know, Carlsen needs to be able to generate play on this long diagonal or get that dark square bishop into play somehow to compensate for those um, isolated pawns. Bishop g5. And h6. And here Carlson thought for four minutes and plays what looks like a very natural move. And that's to play the rook into the middle, gaining time against the queen before deciding what to do with the bishop. But actually Niemann played an excellent move here. Very good response. Instead of moving the queen, bishop e6. And it's hard for the queen to find a good square. It's hard to... You know, if, for example, queen a4, then queen a5 is, is a good response. And that will force a queen exchange. And black is very comfortable here. Knight in an excellent position looking at these squares. And a rook ready to come to c8 to attack the c3 pawn. Carson thought for over 15 minutes in this position. And that's already an indication that he wasn't feeling too comfortable. But he decided to go for the end game directly. So now we've got an exchange of pieces. Exchange of rooks in the corner. <clears throat> exchange of bishop for knight. Which does at least damage black's kingside pawns. 
But because they're kind of clumped together, it's not such a serious weakness. I mean, it already feels as though black is slightly better here. Pawn on e2 is attacked, so it gains another tempo. But it's those split pawns that are a long-term weakness. And basically, Carlson is already a bit worse here. King e1, so Carlson is preparing to bring the rook over to d1. Knight a5, good move. So securing control over b3 and c4. <clears throat> so rook d1, you want to challenge the open file. And now, instead of exchanging on d1, which would give... Um, white some respite actually. Niemann thought for 12 minutes here but comes up with a very strong move. Rook c8. He's keeping the rook on the board in order to attack the pawn c3. And now Carlson decides to play knight d2. Attacking the bishop, opening up this one, and the bishop dropped back to e6. And this is actually, you know, quite um, a key moment in the game, <clears throat> and and is such a typical uh, um, position for for end games. Not just for end games, actually, but mainly for end games where. White has to decide, or one side has to decide, whether you play passively, whether you defend your weaknesses, or whether you play actively. And there is no hard and fast rule to this. In some positions, it's correct to play passively, and in some positions, you're right to play actively. Carlson hates playing passively. That's what we can say. And so often, it pays off for him that when he decides <clears throat> to play actively you know he generates enough play to compensate for for material the material he's given up so you know here he could play passively with rook c1 just to defend that weakness um and and black has nothing concrete here you know, black, black has nothing certain. You, you know, you can roll forward, you know, maybe trying to play the pawn to e4. And black brings the king into the middle or up to f6. It's pleasant for black, but nothing tangible as yet. But Carson plays instead for activity. He gives up this pawn. Bishop takes, knight takes, rook takes, and he gets some freedom for his rook, and he's hoping to get some play with the rook and the bishop. And bishop d5. So you can see that bishop, to some extent, dominates the knight, and Carlson wants to just cut back with the rook to attack f7. So that's why the rook came back here. Rook a8, hassling the pawns from behind. And rook b8. And now f5. Good move because Nimon at, at some moment would like to come forward with the king, maybe play e4. Rook e8, e4. Um, but Carlson forces this and breaks up the pawns with g4. So, of course, the more pawns that Carlson exchanges, then that will help him to try to make a draw. So, you know, there's, there's no doubt who's better in this position. Black is better. And Carlson is struggling already. Rook c5. Good move. This is one of the problems, actually, with white's position. If you could get an anchor for that bishop in the middle of the board, if you could have secured the position of the bishop at some point, you know, maybe with e4 or... Um, then it will be a very different situation. But because that bishop doesn't have an anchor, then Niemann is able to hassle it and really gain from that. So the bishop comes back to a2. 
Also not a secure square. And now knight c4. Um, it, it's, there was a very interesting interview with uh, Niemann and uh, Alejandro Ramirez in St. Louis after the game, uh, where there was a real discussion between computer evaluations and practical eva evaluations. And according to Sessa, this Norwegian sub supercomputer, after knight c4, if white takes this uh, and plays the rook and pawn endgame, then this should be a draw. But uh, Niemann was kind of going, well, in practical play, you know, this just looks fantastic for black. It should be winning. Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to delve into the details of that. But Carlsen instead played a4, and I think it's a very understandable move. Uh, you know, the bishop, I've, I've already said it's maybe not the best piece because it doesn't have an anchor, but still, you know, Carlsen wants to keep the possibility of counterplay against f7. You know, he's striving to act for activity. Uh, and I can understand why he didn't want to play the rook and pawn endgame. In any case, this is what happened. Knight, the knight came back. Rook e7. Pawn takes pawn and g4. By the way, I'll, I'll put the link to that interview, post-game interview, uh, in the uh, comments because it, it's it's uh, very revealing, actually. I think it says a lot about modern chess as well. Rook d7. And here Niemann played an excellent move. Pawn to e3. So you could say that the knight also has a problem here, but it doesn't have an anchor. It needs security. But e3, this starts to give it security. So first of all, if rook takes knight, then check and pawn takes pawn and black wins. Therefore, that pawn has to be taken. But now the knight finds a beautiful square on e4. And once again, there are problems with a potential mate here. I mean, I know the rook can come back to d1, but that that uh, means that white is really restricted now. I mean, what a beautiful square for the knight on e4. If rook takes f7 check, this actually will transpose roughly to the game. Um, I, I, won't, I won't go into too much detail because, yeah, as I said, we're going to see something very similar. So Carlsen just nudged the king to the king's side. Uh, just getting out of these mating threats and rook c2 attacking these two yeah once again the the loose bishop rook takes pawn check the king has to go back and that carlson cannot have enjoyed making that move because his king is just horribly placed on the back rank uh, niemann just repeated the position a couple of times to get to the time control well, almost at the time control. And now, well, I mean, black is dominating here. Carlson thought for about five minutes and played bishop d5. Uh, rook b7 is actually still gives white uh, chances to draw this one. Um, Knight g5 looks pretty strong, but actually there's a really weird move. I mean, this is computery stuff, of course. Uh, Bishop h5 apparently gives white drawing chances, but, you know, in practical terms, so difficult to hold this. Bishop d5 played instead. Rook d2, excellent move. And, and that really breaks white's coordination, actually. Obviously, there's a pin on the d-file, so the knight can't be taken. Rook check. King came back. Uh, excuse me, the rook came back. Um, again, supercomputers think unbelievably that white has chances to draw this position, to draw this rook and pawn endgame. It looks absolutely horrible for uh, white. Uh, and I'm not surprised that Carlson rejected that. But anyway, that's what that's what they say. Um, I'm sure if you want to find analyze that yourself, then please do look at the detail. But yeah, I mean, in a practical game, this looks absolutely terrible. 
And this is a really nice move, knight g5. This is well calculated. So this knight wants to swing in to, uh, you know, f3, h3. And the point is that after this, in fact, black is not losing the rook because of this check. And I think we can say for certain now that black really is winning. Black is a pawn up. King and knight, very active. There's this queenside pawn majority, distant pawn majority. And even this kingside pawn majority is very uh, potent, actually. Uh, the white's e-pawn obviously going nowhere. This really is lost. Carlson tried a5 to fix those pawns on light squares, but actually this was a pretty simple technique. The king prevents the bishop coming to d5. Knight check. If king takes g4, then knight takes, and then the knight will just canter back to just mop up those pawns. So king f2, knight takes h2. Okay, this is really desperate stuff from Carlson. You know, he's trying to bring this bishop into the game. Of course, he wants to just bring it back to d5. But whatever he does here, it's losing. And uh, Niemann has calculated this exactly. He basically realized well in advance that the knight gets back to capture the a pawn. Nothing that the Carlson could have done about that. And this is a theoretical win, of course. Um, the Carlson tries one last little trick, bishop d5, dominating the knight. And, of course, black needs to be able to bring that knight back into play. Um, if you play king e5, pushing the bishop, actually that fails to this, and white gets to take the last pawn. But instead of that, it's very simple. Advance the h-pawn first. And in this position... I think that was the final move of the game, actually, king e5. It's not quite clear from the um, moves I have, but I'm pretty sure king e5 was the final move. It's a good place for Carson to resign. So the bishop just gets pushed out of the way. And then once the knight rejoins the king and the two pawns, then it is a very, very easy win. So the king is going to come here. The knights will come into the game via e3 or e5. And then those pawns will advance very simply. Once black has all the pieces in a nice pack, it is very easy just to roll the pawns home. So there we go. Magnus Carlsen defeated by the 19-year-old Hans Niemann, um, who is very outspoken. Remember in Miami when he defeated Carlson and he was approached for an interview after um, that first rapid play game. He, he sort of brushed the interviewer aside and said, my chest speaks for itself. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Um, and certainly his chest spoke for itself in this game. Um, very convincing. I thought his technique was ex excellent. No matter what the computer says um, about Carlson's drawing chances. Actually, I thought Niemann played very well indeed. So Magnus got a taste of his own medicine. That was really outplayed. So where did Carlson go wrong? Well, okay, there are those moments where the computer points out deep into the end game, where you know there's some technical draw. But actually, it's just in practice impossible to hold those kind of positions. I think we need to go right back to the opening. It wasn't the best opening from Carlson, but you know sometimes he doesn't produce um, the best opening. But Rook F D one gave after Bishop B six gives Black a very favourable end game. So Rook D one is a mistake. He should have just taken on F six and played Knight D two. And with best play, it's probably about equal. But White certainly doesn't have any difficulties here because that Knight is going to. Leap, in, leap into, whoops, excuse me a second. It's going to leap into the game. If 
fire here and that bishop is open. It's about level. Um, and then later on, big moment, that big decision, should he play passively or should he play actively? And it was probably correct or, or a better chance of holding the game to play passively, something that Carlson hates to do often is a big mistake. That's what he should have done. Um, there you go. Anyway, very exciting. Hans Niemann, a new talent, um, very fiercely ambitious. Let's see how he gets on in the rest of the tournament. But at the moment, he is leading the Sinkfield Cup with two and a half out of three. And with that on the live rating list, he breaks into the 2700 club as well.